one question and a follow-up. Um, and uh, libre à vous de poser des questions dans la langue officielle de votre choix. And um, we have about, I think, 15 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. So uh, who has the first question? Uh, okay. Natalie Pearson from Bloomberg News. Um, you seem to suggest in the speech that the recent market volatility is healthy and reflects a more normal economy. Is there still a danger of repeat of things such as the Fed's taper tantrum here in Canada? Well, I, I think I, I also mentioned in the speech that markets do have a tendency to overreact and that there may have been some technical factors that drove the, the, the big uh, uh, movements in equity markets a few weeks ago. So it's not all, uh, it's not all healthy, but, uh, but I think, I think, I, I think the, the basic point that you mentioned is valid, that, uh, that volatility has been at an artificially low level for the last uh, few years, and it is largely reflecting the, uh, you know, the, the behavior of central banks, and, uh, and uh, that, that it's probably a good sign if that starts to, uh, to change. Do you have a follow-up? Uh, no, I have a different question, if that's okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. And um, why do you believe that the economy is still on track if growth for uh, growth missed your for your fourth quarter forecast by so much? Well, uh, here I think it's important to look at the composition of of uh, growth and the fact that uh, that if you look at final domestic demand, which is a uh, which is a measure of how much Canadian households, business, and government are are spending, that's been growing solidly at four percent or so throughout. 2017. Now, why uh, headline GDP growth was weaker was, you know, for two reasons. One was that investment, um, sorry, it was that in, in, imports were weaker. Uh, and, sorry, uh, step back. So imports, were, there was a surge in imports, uh, but the surge in imports was partly uh, because of the strength of business investment. And the strength of business investment itself is a good sign. It's, uh, it's a sign that businesses are actually investing in the in the future of the, of the Canadian economy. So, so uh, that's um, you know that on the whole uh, is is a, is a more positive picture than uh, than the headline growth number would suggest. So it's the fact that uh, it's the fact that the domestic component of, of growth was still pretty solid, while the you know the the increase in imports was you know partly driven by by uh, you know, positive investment developments and partly uh, by some other temporary factors. Thank you. Leah, I, if you could use the microphone, please. Sure. Pardon me, I'll just have to run back and forth. Um, on the U.S. steel tariffs, um, Trump has said Canada will be exempt, at least for now. Does that mitigate the bank's concern that you mention about the serious consequences, or does the bank have to remain on hold until there's more clarity around trade in general? Well. Uh, we didn't say that we have to remain on hold until there's more clarity. We did say that the lack of clarity is a factor that has a dampening effect on the outlook. And, uh, you know, it, it is one of the reasons that we're cautious in moving. But uh, we moved in January, even though, the, uh, even though that uncertainty was still, uh, was still there. Um, now, as far as the, the particular uh, measures, I would say, uh, I mean, the news about the, the, what was said about steel has changed uh, uh, quite a lot in the last few days, and uh, and uh, the announcement was made. Uh, there was a particular announcement made just now, but never never quite clear. Uh, I mean, it's, it's still a pretty fluid situation, and I would say we're not um, we're not uh, in, in a situation of uh, of, of uh, you know calling uh, 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 calling all clear, and and uh, you know I, I would say there's still a significant degree of uncertainty around the. Uh, around the future trade regime. Just to follow up, um, can you just talk a little bit about the discussion around the interest rate decision this week and how much of that discussion focused on trade? It was one of a number of factors that, uh, that was part of our deliberations, but um, uh, you know, that's along with uh, what uh, is, is generally a very positive economic outlook, the fact that we've had uh, a, uh, we've had uh, a very good year in 2017, uh, even though we see growth moderating uh, in the latter part of the year and uh, going into 2018, um, it's, it's still moderating to a pace which is above the growth of potential. And that's a context where, um, 
where uh, we, we see the Canadian economy getting back onto a more solid footing. And so it's, uh, you know, the trade uncertainty is, is a factor that is, uh, is, is uh, you know, definitely a risk to the outlook, but it's not, uh, it's, it's not the, uh, uh, it, it, it's sort of one among a number of factors that we look at in making a decision. Excuse me, David Ebner from the Globe and Mail. In terms of the, the U.S. Trade Representative spoke about wanting to conclude NAFTA quite quickly in the next month, month and a half. Uh, the next rate decision is roughly in mid-April. How, how much could the bank act depending on the range of possibilities of the outcome? Well, we're not going to speculate about what, uh, you know, what the outcome might be. I mean, at this point, this is, you know, certainly it's our colleagues in the in the trade ministry that are uh, that are involved in these negotiations and I mean our uh, we, we'll basically have to uh, have to see what comes out and uh, and uh, and then we'll have to decide what to that might mean for our monetary policy and there I think it's important to bear in mind that any change in Canada's trade rules would probably affect Canada through a variety of channels it would probably have an immediate effect on exchange rate it would probably have an effect on business investment, and it would probably also affect Canada's exports down the road. But, but the exact timing of those things and, and what, what their relative magnitude would be depends a lot on the specifics of what's announced and, and also just of how businesses and other governments react to it. So, so at this point, there's quite a wide range of possible outcomes, and we're not really going to build anything in until we see it. And then separately, um, the housing market it was addressed yesterday with the rate decision. Um, in 2011, Governor Carney was here and he warned of overheated housing market, potentially overheated housing market in Vancouver and in Canada in general. And uh, seven years later, uh, he was right. It went crazy. Um, what, what's the bank's view now in particular on the Vancouver housing market where affordability is extremely beyond any average person? Well, we have been, as you, as you noted, we have been focused on housing markets as part of our assessment of financial stability in Canada, and uh, for some time we've been concerned that um, that housing, uh, you know, and, and the household indebtedness that goes along with current housing markets could uh, could could be a factor that would uh, that would amplify the effect of any negative shock affecting Canada. So if we had a if we had some events that uh, that, that had a negative effect on Canada's economy, then then. Uh, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a context where house prices are relatively high and where the, where the, uh, uh, and where the uh, household de households are relatively indebted, then that's more likely to translate into, into financial system stress. And that in turn would have a bigger, a bigger overall economic effect. So, so it is something we've been tracking for so, quite some time. Now, in the current picture, of course, there are a lot of moving parts. And, uh, you know, we've had the, the various provincial government measures here in BC and also in, in, in Ontario that were introduced and are sort of working their way through. We've got the new measures um, uh, introduced in the BC budget, which we haven't had a chance to analyze yet. We've had the federal government measures uh, that OSFI introduced to tighten up some of the rules around, around mortgage underwriting. And then we've got our own actions in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, effect of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of those uh, uh, moves to increase interest rates. And, and all of those are affecting the housing market in some, you know, but, but, uh, but you know, with a lag, but with different lags. And so, and so we're really going to have to watch how those things play out uh, to, get a, to get an overall picture of, 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 of where things are going. But, I mean, the broad, broad effect of all of those is, it's, you know, we, we think that based on past experience, these are all factors that are going to dampen housing market activity. And, uh, and, uh, and, and that's, uh, you know, that's, that, that's uh, going to have, you know, that's going to be something that we factor into our outlook for the Canadian economy. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, Chuck Chang with uh, Business in Vancouver. Um, just a point of clarification, you mentioned in the speech that uh, uh, Western Canada uh, heavy oil has not benefited from the recovery of the oil price as much as the rest of the world uh, market. And you mentioned bottlenecks. Can you clarify what those bottlenecks are and whether, you know, if those bottlenecks are um, um, resolved that um, these, uh, these, that will contribute to future Bank of Canada considerations for the interest rate moving forward? Well, certainly those, those oil prices are something that factor into our economic outlook, and particularly because they affect uh, investment in, uh, in our oil sector. We saw, for example, three years ago when the price of oil uh, collapsed, that, uh, 
that investment in, in Canada's oil and gas sector dropped about 60%, and that had a big impact. And we had you know, two quarters of negative growth in Canada as a whole as a result of that. So it's, it's, it's obviously a big, a big factor in Canada's economic growth outlook. Now, the current situation you alluded to is one where, where we've had uh, world prices pick up, but where, where the, the, the benchmark price for Canadian heavy oil, which is WCS, um, has been uh, recently at a spread of, of, uh, over, of two, over $25 a barrel uh, below um, uh, below uh, WTI or West Texas Intermediate, and that spread is largely reflecting um, the, uh, the the bottlenecks in transportation, and those include the fact that pipeline capacity isn't there, and the fact that uh, oil oil transport by rail is also somewhat limited because it's sort of caught up in that whole Western Canadian rail uh, situation, which has a number of causes, but related to um, both the uh, Rail capacity and the uh, and the the, you know, the strong agricultural the, uh, harvest, which has been competing for rail capacity, and on top of that, of course, we've had some outages in in some major pipelines. So all of that is is something that I mean, for the time being, is is um, is uh, uh, you know reducing the, uh, the the reducing what Canadian oil producers get for each barrel of oil that they produce, and it, it has a bearing on their investment decisions going forward. Chuck, did you have a follow-up? No. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Just, just to follow up on the housing question. So, um, yeah. I mean, the message has seemed to be in for a while that the, ha that the housing market could amplify the effects of a negative shock. But given all the measures that you just referred to that could actually dampen the housing market, is there no risk that the housing market itself could create a negative shock? Uh, that is a risk, and it's one that we've, um, we've highlighted in our financial system review. In fact, also in, in sometimes in our monetary policy report, the the possibility that the housing market could cool down too much, and I guess one of the one of the aspects of that that we, we highlight is the fact that uh, you know when we're looking at our own monetary policy decisions, one of the reasons that we're very cautious there is that we want to make sure that we're, we're taking adequately taking stock of what our moves uh, to to raise interest rates are doing to, uh, to 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 housing markets and to household uh, expenditures more generally, and. You know, and, and in, in that we're trying to be we're trying to be careful to make sure that we don't uh, we don't over uh, we don't over adjust uh, we don't uh, we don't move too quickly. But in the same way, you you know, the central bank tries to pace its interest rate decisions. There That's seems right. to be a big contrast with the housing market, where just a slew of measures have come in all at once. There's been no pace uh, in policy decision, decisions directed at the housing market. Do you see that? We are any closer to the risk that the housing market could implode than we were, say, six months ago before all of these new rules came in? Well, as I said, there are a lot of moving parts. I mean, a lot of you know different measures introduced by different level, measures of levels of government and 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 targeted to different regions of the country. And so, uh, we're really going to have to be observing these things as we go along. And you know, we, we we've sort of seen some of the experience with previous measures, which did, you know. Uh, did, did have some dampening effect on on, on the markets, but uh, but I think this time we'll just have to watch and see how things evolve. Uh, I think we have time for two more questions. I, Leo is next. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the deceleration in consumer credit growth over the last three months. Um, is the bank concerned that past rate hikes are hitting consumers to the extent that uh, future hikes should wait? Well, we did. Yeah, we did highlight the fact that consumer. Uh, that household credit growth is, is, has been decelerating, uh, but that's exactly what we'd expect to see uh, in, in, in an economy where the uh, where where interest rates are, are being uh, have been increased. And uh, it's, it's uh, at this point, I think we, we we haven't really done the full kind of analysis to be able to calibrate whether the the, the slowdown in credit is is sort of in line, whether it's it's more or less than we would have we should have expected. But it's but it's broadly in the direction that we would have expect, that we would have expected, and and so we put that out as being as being something that kind of confirms our overall narrative. I think we have a question over here, and then. Sorry, this is the the value of the Canadian dollar yeah, being lower. Yes, okay, right. Yeah. yeah. So is it the factors that you think not change the interest rate now? Maybe maybe 
maybe later in April uh, meeting. But um, and also, um, is it um, is the lower luminous good for our export uh, for our trade now? Well, in general. Um, in general, the, uh, the Canadian dollar is, is one of the things that we take into account in in our overall economic outlook. Now, uh, you know, we have we don't have a new set of, of projections uh, for for the Canadian economy, and we'll be uh, you know we'll be doing that. In fact, our staff are now working on it, but they haven't shown we, they haven't shown me yet. Um, uh, but basically, uh, the, uh, the the current the level of the exchange rate is, of course, one of the things that affects. Uh, affects our overall economic outlook. And typically when we're making that forecast, we assume that the, the current level is the one that will prevail over the projection period. Um, and that will be the level that, that uh, you know, the, the current level will sort of feed into, into the projection in that way. But it's something that, uh, you know, it's, it's of course not, not the only thing we look at, but it's certainly one of the things that, you know, other things being equal would, 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 would be encouraging for Canadian exports and would make you know, on, on the margin would, uh, would make Canadian exports a bit more competitive and would, uh, would therefore uh, make the Canadian outlook a little bit stronger. Last question. Did you have one? Uh, very short, uh, last question. Uh, would you, uh, just looking at all the factors, you know, every positive seems to be mitigated by some sort of negative and vice versa. Would you, would it be fair to call this a wait and see decision in terms of uh, the decision on the interest rate uh, that was announced yesterday? Well, we did uh, decide not to move the rate this time. We decided that the uh, that the rate remained appropriate in light of everything we were looking at. But at the same time, in our decision, we also highlighted that. Uh, that um, that over time rates will need to be need to be higher. Now, as as the governor has emphasized in the past, we're not on a preset path to a higher interest rate. Um, it's something that we have to we have to look at cautiously, and we have to look at, at various economic indicators. But but I think that what we'd say this time is that as the decision was that uh, the rate remains appropriate at this time. But of course, every decision is a live decision, and in April we'll have to look at all the data in light of our new forecast. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and face those questions again. Okay, that concludes the Q&A session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Deputy Governor. Thank you. Thank you.